I'm so excited about close-up photography. How many people here have an iPad? Okay, next, next year when I ask this question, I think everyone's hand is gonna be raised. But I have this little uh, app called the Butterfly Wonders, and this presentation is really the close-up part of, uh, of that app. Before I talked about, I also have a book called Flying Flowers, I don't have it here, but it's called Flying Flowers, The Beauty of the Butterflies. For a year, this is all I did. I got focused on close-up photography. I got focused on photographing butterflies. It was so much fun. You don't have to go, as you'll see, I've been all around the world photographing butterflies, but you don't have to go far to get great butterfly pictures. By the way, the pictures look better on the screens here than they do up here. I photographed this cabbage white butterfly on a morning glory in my backyard. Butterflies don't fly around until it's 72 degrees. They, they just don't take off and fly. If you want to capture butterflies not moving, it's a lot easier. Photograph early in the morning. Now, I mentioned that with the ring light that I have over here. And again, I know I talk fast. Don't be afraid or don't be shy about interrupting. I mentioned this beautiful shadowless lighting that we can get with the ring light. You don't see any shadows there. That's the beauty of a ring light, eliminating all the shadows or creating shadows if you like. This is the same kind of lighting you would get on, there's a little bit of shadow on the right side of the butterflies on the top right side, but generally there's no shadows. It's the same kind of lighting you would get on an overcast day. Here's another butterfly that I photographed on another flower in my backyard. Again, beautiful shadowless lighting. When you're using the ring light, you want to set your camera on manual. By the way, is David still here? I think they're recording this, so you could go back and watch it so you don't have to take notes, which is really nice of uh, B&H to do that. And they'll give you information on how to, how to uh, get to that link. Anyway, it's beautiful shadowless lighting. Now, how many people here would like to write a book or have a book published? Okay, just a few. If you have an idea for a book, my advice is team with an expert. I am not a butterfly expert, so I teamed with Alan Chin Lee on my book and on my app, and he supplied all the information. And this is a great way to learn. There's an old expression, if you want to become an expert on something, write a book about it. <laughs> so I teamed with him, and we both learned a lot about butterflies. Talking about going to, um, uh, not having to go to great places to take uh, great close-up pictures. I had a job once and the client wanted me to go to uh, coast, uh, Panama actually to photograph the people and the wildlife. People and the wildlife. This is the shot they wanted. They wanted a shot of a red-eyed tree frog looking right at the camera. I'm in Panama for two weeks, can't find the tree frog. And I come home, I say I couldn't find the tree frog. They said, well, that was part of the deal. We want a picture of a red-eyed tree frog. Doesn't have to be from Panama, but we want that shot. Museum of Natural History has them. Well, they probably wouldn't let me photograph it and get such a close-up shot. So what I did is I sent away to California to a pet supply store for two red-eyed <laughs> for two red-eyed tree frogs. Now I used to, if you go to the New York Aquarium, uh, well you won't see them there now because it's been a while. I used to collect fish with scientists for the New York Aquarium from Australia and Papua New Guinea and the Red Sea. And we would catch the fish, bring them back in a plastic bag with a little bit of water and oxygen. This is how aquariums get fish. It's, well, this is uh, the way they ship uh, frogs, too. So the frog comes in a plastic bag in the styrofoam container, ship FedEx overnight. I open it up. I put it on a plant in my kitchen. And this is the very same black T-shirt that, <laughs> that my son held behind the red-eyed tree frog. So you can get great shots. Now, and here's the, here's the uh, first shot we took. Again, you don't always have to have the subject, you know, full frame. Some, you know, with people pictures, my tip is take the portrait and take the environmental portrait. Yes? With the ring light, did you say people that probably can do that handheld? Well, the question was, can you do the ring light handheld? There'd be, unless you want to, if you want, if I wanted to, like, create just, like, top light, top light only in the ring light, I could detach it from the lens and hold it down. Okay, the question is, and that's a good question, I wasn't clear. When you're using the ring light, the flash fires, just like the regular flash on your camera, in about a ten thousandth of a second. That's one of the big advantages to shooting with the ring light. You don't need a tripod. 
because it goes off so fast. You still want to watch your shutter speed because if the shutter speed's too low, what's going to happen is you might get a little shake. So take the portrait, take the um, environmental portrait. Here's, in the, here's a picture taken at the American Museum of Natural History of a butterfly, this beautiful flower. Look at this beautiful black background. It's not my t-shirt. Here's this straight out of the camera shot. You see all these signs and everything in the background, right, in the wall. I spend a lot of time in Photoshop working on my pictures because the background, just like you see here, the background makes this picture. The background is so very, very important. So what I was doing is I just went in here and I, I cropped out some of the stuff, cropped it tighter and I dodged it. I, I burned it, made it darker and got this beautiful color shot. Again, it looks way better here than here from this shot. So envision the end result. Think about the end result. So, what, okay, very good question. He's, he's joking, edible. Uh, because I am a conservationist, there's a, uh, I live in Cronon Hudson, New York. In Peekskill, New York, there's a very big uh, pet supply store. So actually, and probably this was the first out of the camera shot uh, I got, it was amazing. My son and I took it to the uh, place where it had a nice happy home where someone would uh, take care of it. Because I definitely didn't have the wherewithal to uh, take care of it. But ask questions like that. What inspired me to do the butterfly book, I was photographing butterflies and this uh, white morpho butterfly landed on my uh, ring light here. Just a, kind of like a, a cosmic thing. I said, okay, I have to do a book on, uh, on butterflies. I mentioned that if you're an easier, an easier lens to use on, uh, for, on your SLRs is a 50 millimeter. The advantage to the 100 millimeter lens is, again, there's a further subject to camera distance. So you might not fire, you might not scare away skittish butterflies, which is an advantage when you're photographing butterflies and moths. Another alternative, I don't use these, so I don't have pictures of them, are these close-up lenses. Close-up lenses for, actually these are extension tubes, sorry, extension tubes for your existing lenses. If you have a regular 100 millimeter lens, if you have a regular 50 millimeter lens, you place this between the lens and the camera, lets you get closer for somewhat, uh, some like, kind of like macro photography. They actually work very well. Your pictures are not going to be as sharp for sure as they are with a real true macro lens. However, if you're skilled at Photoshop, Lightroom, and Aperture, you can sharpen your pictures. You can't sharpen an out of focus picture, obviously, right? But this is a good, you know, look at the, here's like a uh, hundred and, uh, well, this is 167, here's this one and the Canon one's 130. Well, this is for three and the Canon one's for one. You always get, thanks for the water, David. We're gonna feed the butterflies later. I'll let them drink. You always get what you pay for. You buy the off brand, you're not gonna get a sharper picture as you are with the brand name. Same with teleconverters for your long lenses, yes. Yes, you could use a Canon 50 mil, right, to get, e to get even closer. But you really... Yeah, but you can't really afford the 100 millimeter. If you can't afford the 100 millimeter, get that. Yep. Yes. Hmm? And you know what, since you asked that question, I'm going to let you come up, remind me. You're going to be one of the first people to shoot with this. What? Okay. By the way, when you're using this macro, uh, this um, ring light or the twin light, like David recommended, uh, you see we have no light in the eyes here. Here we see the reflections of the two tubes. We see uh, the reflection of the two tubes right in the, right in the, uh, in the cute little froggy's eyes. So watch for these reflections. You, you're going to have to clone them out. If I go back to this shot, let me just go through this. Let me see if I can see them here. I was using the ring light, I guess I cloned them out. You could see here, you can see the top and the bottom one here, but I spent some time doing that. This is just one of the things you have to watch for when you're using the ring light. You want to look for these, you want to look for these reflections. We're going to get to that. That will let you get closer. 
But it sounds like you're really serious. Okay, there's, there's another alternative that's really great, which is the 65 millimeter. Are you Canon? Yeah. Canon, which is really, really good. So, uh, okay, here we got, we got went through this. Okay, so here's the ring light again. The beauty is, whether you're Canon, Nikon, or Sony probably makes one too, might be a Minolta one. You can swivel this, you can control the angle of the lighting. This is what David was talking about, right? Is this? Yeah. No? Oh, he was talking about speed lights. Well, speed lights are about $500 each. That's a thousand bucks. I don't know what this costs, but I think it's less than a thousand. Hey, the air conditioning just came on. You feel it? The advantage to this, you could swivel these like all around, right? You could swivel these around. You could adjust the, the power of the different tubes. You have modeling lights here. You also have a modeling light on this. I think it might have to be on to, uh, no, no, you can see. You can see that the modeling lights uh, come on. This is a good thing because the modeling lights show you where your shadows are going to be. There's an old expression, light illuminates, shadows define. Sometimes shadows can add a definition to the picture. Over here in some of the shots you saw, I had no shadows. But in some of the shots you'll see, I do have shadows. If you want to get even closer, this is the Canon 65 millimeter manual focus lens. You can get so close with this lens, you could fill, you could fill the, um, the frame with a grain of rice. And I have some pictures in here taken with that. 65 millimeter macro. I think that's, we have to go on the B&H site. I think it's about 1300 bucks. But if you're serious about it, it's manual focus and uh, the depth of field is very, very shallow. The longer the lens, the shallower the depth of field. In close-up photography, or in true macro photography, depth of field is what you really are thinking about. But shutter speed does come into play. Here, we have a very shallow depth of field. Praying mantis photographed in my backyard. Now, I might have been really close. I might have been set here at f8, which on a wide-angle lens gives you tremendous depth of field, but with close-up photography, just like with long lenses, the depth of field is very, very, very shallow. It's really important to check, use your depth of field preview button. You don't have one on your little camera. Your depth of field uh, preview button uh, on your camera to check your depth of field. And it's all about the story that you want to tell. You know, we're going to talk technical today, but just like with any photograph, it's all about the depth of field. Here's the same shot with a lot of depth of field, right? So if you're telling a story about, you know, the animal's eyes and you want to uh, focus attention to the eyes, use shallow depth of field. And then if you want more depth of field, you open up. This is the main thing you want to think about when you're photographing. You all, yes? You mentioned getting close. Yeah. Using the 65 millimeter as an example. Does that mean you're physically closer or that the lens is going so the, 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 the question is, good question. On the uh, 65 millimeter, say this is a 65 millimeter lens. She said not only can you get close, like 100 millimeter will get you closer than a 50 from the same place. Yeah, on the 65 you can get you can get like this close. But are there lenses that you can get back to filling up the frame and turning you away? You could use a 300. I have a picture in here with a 300 millimeter, a 100 to 400 millimeter lens set at 300. Then I filled the frame with a, a, a humming moth. So, yeah, so it, it, depends, it depends on how close you are, how, how close the uh, lens lets you focus, but on the 65 millimeter specifically, you, you, can, get, you can get like this close, almost, almost right on top. It's kind of like a bellows, which is another option, but I don't know anyone who uses bellows systems today, but they sell them here at uh, B&H. Yes? But these two photos, uh, uh, what, what's the difference for the, the one with the better? The What's the difference in the f-stop? Well, I, I about because I don't remember, but this is probably wide open f2.8, and this might be at f11. Okay, so but even one f-stop can make a difference. The other thing, yes. Question is, am I shooting a manual focus or autofocus? All the pictures you've seen so far autofocus. When you're using that 65 millimeter lens. You have to do manual focus. 
Uh, if you don't want this if sub main subject in focus, you might want to set the background in focus and blur the foreground, as you'll see here in coming up. You, you could use manual focus. But I think no one in this room can focus faster than an autofocus lens. Just as simple as that. Also, think about the end result. Here's the straight out of the camera shot. One of the big things in macro photography, closer photography, is usually you don't get as close as you want to get, especially if you don't have a 100 millimeter macro lens. Here, what I did is I took this shot, here's the straight out of the camera shot, I cropped the shot, I made it square, I increased the saturation, I increased the color, I increased the sharpness. So I took this shot, which is okay, and I turned it into this shot where you could see, you know, the antenna of the uh, animal's head. And just one quick thing about sharpening, then we'll get to the questions. You always want to sharpen selectively. You don't want to sharpen globally. There'd be no reason to sharpen the background in this picture. You sharpen the background, you're going to increase the noise. Here I'm just sharpening the eyes and the head and maybe part of the body. After the presentation, I can talk about how to photograph, how to sharpen selectively. If you, if you have CS5, use Convert to Smart Filter. That's the easiest way to do it. And that lets you apply um, a filter the sharpening filter like you would do an adjustment layer and a layer mask. But think about the end result in all your photography. Straight out of the camera shot, a much more dramatic shot because they cut out what I call the dead space. There's a lot of dead space in this picture where nothing is really of interest. So move in, zoom in closer. This is a little moth I photographed with the ring light down in Florida. I want to draw attention to these antenna which can detect another moth more than 600 yards away when they're looking for mates. So this is kind of like uh, interesting. So I wanted to draw attention to that. In people photography, my number one tip is shoot eye to eye, see eye to eye. That way, you know, if I'm, pho it's Bobby, right, or Bob? Yes. You know, if I'm photographing Bobby like this, if I photograph him eye to eye, he has great eyes, by the way, uh, when you look at his picture, you'll relate more to it than if I'm down like this or if I'm shooting up like this. Same thing in close-up photography. It's not always possible, but keep it in mind. Handheld or tripod? This, the, all the shots you've seen so far, well, this is a natural light shot outside because uh, there was a lot of sunlight. I could shoot at a fast shutter speed. All the ring light shots you've seen are all handheld because I'm shooting, again, at maybe a shutter speed of a 60th or a 30th of a second, which lets some light come in, and uh, the ring light goes off at a 10,000th of a second, which illuminates the subject. This is just an, another natural light shot. It really also inspired me to do this butterfly book. These are two clippers, uh, that's the name of the butterfly, two clippers mating. I just thought it was such a beautiful shot. One of the things we could do, in what, one of the things we might want to do is look for the art Look for the art, look for just the beauty in nature. I just love the, the symmetry of this picture and this, mag I guess, a magical moment for the butterflies, <laughs> too. Uh, you asked, go ahead. No, no, no. no. Okay, no. So talking a little bit more about depth of field, and the gentleman in front asked about the f-stops. I don't remember the exact f-stops. For my next presentation, I'll put them in, I'll get the metadata out of the picture. But here you see a detora in my backyard. It's poisonous, by the way but it's a sacred flower in uh, Bhutan. You don't want to eat these, a beautiful flower. This is shot wide open. And as I go through, I'm closing down. So it's all the same shot. So it's all the same shot. But here, I thought the beautiful, you know, very shallow background, just this is in focus. This is taken with a 100 millimeter lens and just the petal right over here is out of focus. So this is more like a snapshot compared to the other, although someone might like this more. And then I was just playing around with the uh, different colors uh, in Photoshop. It's not a butterfly, right? It's not a praying mantis, and it's not really a close-up shot, but I, throw these, I threw these in here this morning to show you that sometimes you want to put something in the foreground. Nice enough shot of a bird, but here I was shooting through some leaves at a wide angle. Picture is a little more artistic. Anyone could take this picture. Maybe not everyone would take this type of picture. So when you're doing your close-ups, if part of the butterfly, insect, whatever, is obstructed by some leaves, embrace the situation, use a wide aperture, and you'll get, you'll get a nice shot.
close, we could also do close-up photography with extremely wide angle lenses. We've been talking about uh, 100 millimeter, 50, 60, uh, and 65 millimeter macro lenses. We could also do close-up photography with extreme wide angle lenses. The wider the lens, the closer we can focus. So here's a straight uh, shot taken with a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Everyone who goes to Galapagos probably takes this type of shot of the marine iguana. Galapagos is the only place where the marine iguanas are found. They have these special mouths that are adapted to eat this, uh, this algae. But anyway, nice enough shot, but here's a close-up shot. Here in this shot, I'm probably six inches away from this marine iguana. And it's a much more dramatic shot than the other one. Everything is in the scene is in focus. You saw with the, with the macro lenses, depth of field is really limited. If you want to have some fun, the woman in the back who's going to buy the 65, I guess, guess you have a nice budget, get, get the, six, get the uh, 15 millimeter fisheye lens too. You could do some really fun stuff with, the, uh, with a super wide angle lens. Here's another shot with a 15 millimeter lens cropped. Again, here with these iguanas, I'm like really close. My tip, see eye to eye? Here I'm seeing eye to eye, but here I'm lower, it gives the subject a greater sense of power. Just a tip, if you go through uh, the Sports, Illustri Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, you'll see that the, um, that the photographers oftentimes shoot the models from below to give them a greater sense of, uh, of power. Watching the background, as I said, is very important. You have all these sensors in your camera. My camera has 45 autofocus points. I still use, someone asked about autofocus, I still use that center focusing point because I want to lock in the focus on the most important part of the subject. Here, it was the animal's eye. Here we see, uh, and it, you know, one of my photography tips is dead center is deadly. But here, I place the animal almost dead center, and sometimes that works. It seems to work in this picture. Here, I place the animal slightly off uh, center. Here's a natural light shot. The animal, the butterfly, just uh, was checking out these eggs here. And here's the flash shot. Here, I eliminated the shadows. I actually like this shot better, because that shadow adds a little sense of depth and dimension. Try it both ways. Try it with, try it with the ring light and try it without the ring light. Try it both ways. Now, this is one of my favorite butterfly pictures. It sh and it's not Photoshop. It shows the animal gracefully flying through the air, right? We have the motion of its wings, where you can see its legs are coming down to land on this flower in my backyard. This is a great example of doing everything right, setting exactly the right shutter speed, setting exactly the right depth of field, and it's my best dumb luck shot. <laughs> I haven't been able to, uh, had a butterfly, I haven't been able to reproduce this. So what I'm saying is experiment with different, experiment with different shutter speeds, okay, because you're gonna get some motion like that. You can get some motion. The slower the shutter speed in daylight, the more of this type of effect you're going to get. David's going to bring around the, the uh, popcorn and the peanuts, I think, in a little, uh, and the hot, hot dogs? I apologize for that air conditioning going out. No, that's okay. That's the least of our worries. Yes? Do you remember this picture what the depth of field Do I remember what, well, I'm sure the shutter speed was around a 15th of a second because that captured this. The depth of field was very shallow. The shut, well, the shutter speed was about a 15th of a second. The aperture, people ask that all the time, and they want to see this in magazines, what the aperture is, right? Right. But my point is going to be this. It dep it, telling you what the aperture, sharing what the aperture is really wouldn't make that much difference because if I shot it with a 300, a 16, a 15, a, a 30, a 40, it, it, and the camera subject distance, you know, the exact aperture you know, would change with all those different lenses and the different uh, flash to subject distance, but it's a good question because you see the background blurred. I would say it was a wide aperture, three, five, four, five, something like that. And since you've asked a lot of questions in all the seminars, you're going to get to shoot too. So I'm watching the background in a lot of these pictures. Anyone guess the name of this butterfly? There you go. 
Here the subject's mostly in the frame. When you're out there photographing, you know, think about the, the standard rules of photography where we want to photograph uh, subjects with complementary colors. So here I'm placing the subject off center, and I just love, I photographed this is, I forget the name of this butterfly. Um, hmm? This is the piano key butterfly? Okay. So anyway, I, I like the way the orange and this color complement each other. Now, this is a ring light picture, but we don't see any shadows. I probably took about 20 pictures of, the, of a scene like this to get this shot. I was working hard, I was working really hard to eliminate the shadows. Here we have a black background, uh, in the, you can see in the way back here. Here we have a little bit of green, a mix of daylight and, uh, uh, and ring light. Yeah, and then in this next one it's total ring light. Again, no shadows. Also look for patterns. Again, the background in close-up photography is just as important as the subject. So the background here, these lines, really complemented the subject. If I had one of my tips in people photography, as Ron, we talked about over the weekend at the Hudson River workshop, don't amputate people at the joints and don't decap decapitate them. If you know, this head was like over here and this leaf was like decapitating the butterfly, so to speak, you know, it would have looked funny. Watch that background, watch your depth of field. Here was a very busy background. The busier the background, the closer you want to get, the wider the aperture. This is called puddling, when David was bringing around the water, that's the expression I should have used, where the butterflies come down and they actually drink, uh, they're actually looking for salt uh, off some of the puddles. But a nice example of shooting eye to eye, seeing eye to eye. Here the background was very distracting, so what I did is I went to Photoshop and, and there actually was a still shot. There was no movement in the wings. I used the motion blur filter, the motion blur filter in Photoshop to add a little sense of motion. Now, these are for like, you know, fun shots. When I was working on the butterfly book with the scientists, I wasn't doing any effects like that. I, I had to submit pictures. We calibrated everything, the printer, the monitor. We created what's called a digital pouch with the color monkey that we sent to the printer, so everything was all coordinated. So I'm not doing any of these fun effects for my serious work with scientists, but I'm sharing them because they are fun. This is amazing. This is taken at the American Museum of Natural History. Learning about the, a subject, any subject, is just so much fun. Anyone see the two snakes in this picture? Hmm? On the wings, right. Birds love moths. Uh, this is an atlas moth. It doesn't eat, by the way. Uh, after it hatches, it lives off its body fat for its whole life. Um, birds like moths and butterflies. They're afraid of snakes. So this animal has evolved. This, like, this looks just like a snake. The eye, the mouth, and the snake's body is going down like this. I mean, I mean that's amazing. So learn about whatever you're photographing. If you go out west and photograph rocks, you know, in the Grand Canyon or Arches National Park, think of, you know, learn about the geology, learning about any subject or a tribe in wherever you're going to go, um, just makes the experience more, more fun. I talked to you uh, just a little while ago about the stuff I do in Photoshop. Here, I was working with a scientist down in uh, Coconut Creek, Florida and we wanted to set up a shot so it was cool in the morning. He carefully placed the butterflies on this flower. Here's a straight out of the camera shot, a boring, you know, out of focus in the background. We see the lens flare and whatever. We were able to turn it into that shot in Photoshop. Macro photography can be a lot of fun. If you don't get the best in result, best uh, uh, shot in camera, think about all you can do in the digital darkroom. When you're photographing, Take the full shot and then move in and take the closer shot. Try to tell the whole story. I have more examples of this as we move along. I'm just going to breeze through these because I want to get to the uh, want to get through the demo. Get to the demo. Photograph sequences. This is a, a caterpillar, or actually a butterfly hatching. All ring light shots, but again, we're telling the story as the butterfly comes out and dries its wings. You can order caterpillars, by the way, uh, mail order, and if you do, you'll see some shots. I raised them in my kitchen while I was doing this butterfly book, 
and it was just amazing to watch these animals hatch. So here's, a, here's a, some more about telling the story. This picture was taken with the 100 millimeter macro lens. This was taken with the 50 millimeter macro lens. And this picture was taken with the 65 millimeter macro lens and the ring light. I talked about on the ring light that you can control the light, right? In the afternoon, late afternoon and early morning, we have a greater, we have pictures with outdoor pictures with the landscape pictures or cityscape pictures with the greater sense of depth and dimension because we have that side lighting because those shadows add a sense of depth and dimension to the picture. So for this shot, because it's relatively flat, I turned off one of the tubes almost all the way and had most of the light coming from this way so I could see all these different scales here. I should have the straight on shot, but I don't. So this is how close you can get with that 65 millimeter macro. You can see each scale. So here's the question. If there's a butterfly expert in the room, please don't, uh, please don't answer. What color are these butter, what, what color uh, is the, are the wings of this butterfly? Any guesses? White. White? Okay, any other guesses? Well, here, here's the answer to the question. It's a trick question. All butterflies have clear wings. All butterflies have clear wings. It's the scales that add to the color. So if the scales come off, all butterflies do have uh, clear, clear wings. And here's just another example of a creative composition. Don't shoot everything straight on. Here I just tilted the camera a little using the disequilibrium effect and I had the wings go from one edge to the other edge and you can see all these scales. You want to shoot. When you're shooting with the ring light, you, there's no need to boost up your ISO. You can shoot at ISO 100, which is another advantage to shooting with the ring light or the twin light or the two flashes like uh, David Brommer was suggesting. If you're doing natural light pictures, close up shutter speed is you really have to set your shutter speed high because just like with the telephoto lens, camera shake is exaggerated. So think about your shutter speed, very important when you're doing natural light pictures. This is a dead leaf butterfly, a photograph down in uh, Coconut Creek, Florida. Uh, a silk moth, a nice black background. Silk moth, same moth in a slightly different position where we could see the background. It's up to you when you're using a ring light what what, uh, what you want the background to look like. If you use a slower shutter speed, you'll get more of the natural light. If you use a faster shutter speed and a small aperture, not enough light's going to come in and the background will go black. We'll try doing that when we start our little demo. I mentioned that uh, a wide angle lens before. This was taken with the 16 to 35 millimeter zoom. You know, I like this shot. Nice enough shot, take with the macro lens. Here I place the subject off center. Again, you look at this, looks like eyes. So if a bird's flying around, looks like all these eyes are looking at it. It looks like the animal is actually uh, bigger than it is. And you saw that picture, the close up. Remember, I, I showed you the picture of the moth that could detect the mate 600 yards away? Well, this is the uh, same moth there. So here, too, I was trying to uh, tell the story. OK. So we have beautiful backgrounds here. How many people think they might try macro photography? True macro, okay, so just about everybody. That's cool. Try this then. <clears throat> the background can make or break the picture. I've said that probably half a dozen times, if not more by now. Well, the background isn't always great. You saw in my uh, kitchen, I used my black t-shirt. Try this. Go out and photograph a leaf and using the blur filter in Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, Lightroom, Aperture, or whatever, blur it a little and then blur it a little more and make inkjet prints. Then you'll have these backgrounds and put them on a piece of cardboard, you'll have these backgrounds that you can take with you. And this is, this is my uh, kitchen when I was working on the butterfly book. Here you see one of the chrysalises. Here you see um, uh, one of the, uh, the butterflies that had just hatched. This was actually my kitchen, we had all these, <laughs> so my wife was really unhappy. But we had the, ca cat caterpillars only eat one type of food, so if you're going to do this seriously, you want to get the right type of uh, food. And, and here's, like, uh, here's like another one. And here's one of the silk butterflies. Before I started this, uh, 
I, I, got, I spent a lot of time photographing silk butterflies, playing with my lighting. You can get them online, that's where I got the guys that I have up here. Oh, so there you see it up there, and here you see arrows pointing to the different, and what, what, uh, caterpillars uh, and chrysalises. What's interesting, my friend from Florida, Alan Chin Lee, the expert, sent me these. He said, whenever he sent them to me, he says it's going to be 12 days before they come out. It's going to be 16 days before they come out. It's going to be nine days before they come out. He was always right. And it's really fascinating because before they come out, they start to shake and... This is really a game of patience because once they start to shake, you don't know if it's going to be an hour or two or three. So we spent a lot of time just watching. But here I want to get a shot of this butterfly, this little caterpillar, but the background in my kitchen was bad, so I used the, uh, the, the printout where the background was like totally blurred. Same thing here. This caterpillar was eating, taken with a 65 millimeter macro lens handheld ring light, but I added that nice green background. Same thing here. Here's a nice plain background. You know, if you're, if you're looking at Sports Illustrated, some of the football players are photographed with like 600 millimeter lens, shot wide open, the background's really blurred. It would look totally out of focus. So I used that third uh, inkjet print th that I showed you. You know, I shot it in focus, blurred it, blurred it, to really draw attention to this, to this subject. So it's a lot of fun to do this. Here, it looks like leaves in the background. Well, here was the shot. This was taken down in Coconut Creek, Florida. Really bad background, but I just held that inkjet print behind it. What you want to look for is shadows. So here's a failure, right? We see the shadows from the ring light, and this background was too plain. The busier the background, like here, the more you can hide, hide, that, uh, hide that effect. Another kitchen shot with the green background. Six, again, 50 millimeter macro lens, a 65 millimeter manual focus lens. So it's really a, a fun, fun project. This is what I was telling you about. You know, if Alan said 12 days, you know, maybe on the t uh, 10th day it looked like this, on the 12th day it would look like this, it would start to shake, and it pops out. Has anyone ever seen this happen? This, it's amazing, right? It pops out so fast, we call this like a little trap door, but then it does hang in there for hours, uh, drying its wings. So I have the whole uh, sequence there. Just some more close-up shots. And here, uh, what you want to do is, again, you want to watch for those reflections. You want to I had to clone them out there. There are some here. That's one of the disadvantages, maybe the only disadvantage to using a uh, ring light. Beautiful shot, right? Again, taken in my kitchen. Here's the, the behind-the-scenes shot. End result shot looks like it been taken outside on a beautiful day. We're just going to breeze through these and then get to the uh, demo. <laughs> so the, the, the question is, uh, did, it, did I have like a million of butterflies flying around my house? No, we have maybe had six, six at a time. We had six at a time, but... Say again? Well, over the, maybe over a day, yeah, we'd have six. So we, we drank a lot of coffee, and it, it took a lot. I mean, we, we couldn't leave. After all this effort, you know, to, to see one of these great creatures hanging, we, we just couldn't miss it. Well, yes. Yes. So how do you not scare them away? Well, one way not to scare them away is to use a long lens, like the 100 millimeter lens. But you'll see I have a picture of a humming moth in here where I used the 100 to 400 millimeter lens set at 300. But you know, if you run after them, you're going to scare them away. The best thing to do is just wait. I have a butterfly bush in my backyard. You just wait, and the butterflies come in. Here's another nice shot of an IO moth here. Looks like it's taken on the bark of a tree. Once again, it's just photographed in my uh, kitchen. Another couple of shots showing the uh, uh, immersion. This is a dagger wing butterfly. Oh, I hate that when that happens. We're almost done, and we're going to get to the live demo before the people have to leave at, uh, at 1. It's a butterfly bush. <laughs> What's a butterfly bush? It's very cool. 
here's a butterfly bush in my backyard. So they come in different colors, okay? Every uh, fall or spring you want to cut them because they grow really fast. It's a terrible picture, it's a busy picture, but it shows you what a butterfly, I just took a snapshot of the butterfly bush in my backyard. Uh, Ron, next time we'll hold the workshop a little earlier in the year, we'll do some uh, close-up photography. But here's a close-up of the flowers, so it attracts beautiful butterflies like this. We have, we have hundreds and hundreds of butterflies a day visiting the uh, butterfly bush. This is the humming moth. Anyone here ever seen a humming moth? The first time, here's a picture of it flying. Taken with the 100 to 400 millimeter lens at 300 millimeters, you asked how not to scare them. Now, it was small in the scene. You use a low ISO, a, a camera with a lot of megapixels, you're gonna not get a lot of noise. But the first time I saw a humming moth, which is about this big, I thought it was like a baby hummingbird, right? I mean, it's a, I, man, I can't believe hummingbirds come that small. But a humming moth is a, really an amazing, amazing creature. Here I added some blur, here I added some more blur. Another example of uh, choosing the right uh, shutter speed and, okay, I'm gonna end, or we're coming near the end. This is one of the most amazing experiences I ever had. Working with these scientists on my app in the butterfly book, we went to Mexico to see the site of the overwintering of the monarchs. All these, there's, there's probably a thousand monarchs, you know, just in this little area. All these trees are covered with monarch butterflies. They come from North America, they, and they get down there. Scientists told, you might wonder, how do they get there, right? How do they know how to get there? Well, they only eat milkweed, according to the science. Well, I know they only eat milkweed, but according to the scientists, that this milkweed has this, these tiny little spindles in it. And when the caterpillar ingests this, these spindles stay in their body, and when they form into a butterfly, there are these little like sacs in their wings, and these uh, spindles are magnetic, and it acts like a compass guiding them down to this. Like, how amazing, oh, wow. how amazing is nature? So anyway, it's a very busy shot. It does show what it looks like. Here I'm getting closer, trying to tell the whole story. Where you have, again, this tree. We saw, we saw like probably 5,000 butterflies take off at one time, land on a branch, and the branch fell off. Because <laughs> there, there were just so many butterflies. Just an incredible, incredible thing. Here, I'm using a wide angle lens, a 16 to 35, to tell the story. Here you can see the, the butterfly's wings. Uh, Line. Here, depth of field is also very important. You see the trees in the back are lined with butterflies. And I'm moving in with my 50 millimeter macro lens to help tell the story. I really like this picture. It's taken with this little butterfly over here. You see these little antennas here? Who's my friend here with a little compact camera? What do you have? G9. G9. I was having lunch. We were there only there for a few hours. And I was having lunch. I had my little G10 with me and I just raised my camera. I took this actually with the G10. So you don't need a $7,000 camera <laughs> to get a shot where you can see the antenna. Also, I cropped this. Again, just never underestimate, or as our past president used to say, don't misunderestimate the, the importance <laughs> of cropping. That joke doesn't go over too good in some of the places that I speak, but it's just a joke. It's just a joke. Go ahead, sir. Do I use the AI servo mode? Okay, the difference, what he's saying is, do I use AI servo on Nikon cameras that's called uh, focus tracking or continuous focus or, or, or whatever, as opposed to one shot? I'm always using, for the butterfly pictures, one shot, because I'm not photographing a single butterfly. Most of the subjects here are not, are not moving. And here I'm, I'm telling the story. The sad part of this story is, there were probably, uh, according to the scientists, when we were there, probably about three million dead and dying butterflies on the ground. Forty million butterflies there. Because what's happening is, all the people around this mountain, this is on the top of the mountain, are chopping down all the trees for firewood and for their homes. So the butterflies have to go higher and higher and higher. So it's getting colder and colder and colder. When we got there, I had all the wrong clothes. It was snowing when we were at the top of the mountain. And, and there was frost, and that's why you see the butterflies on the ground. Uh, but I'm working with scientists, so we got in there and they hired me to document this. It was a sad thing to see, and someone's gonna ask, did you have to walk over them? The answer is yes. But I'm working with the scientists to get the shot, to draw attention to this, 
because something's got to be done. This isn't a conservation speech. I'm just sharing it with you that you know something's got to be done because if they keep taking the trees, there's you know you're gonna have 40 million you know butterflies with no place to go. I'm just gonna share this with you before we start the demo. This gets a lot of laughs, but a good exposure is like a slice of pizza. So here's my advice. I don't know, Ron, if I shared this over the weekend. But if you're making your prints, and if you drink Coke or coffee, it has caffeine in it. If you drink alcohol, this is going to affect the way you see colors. We also see colors at different times of day, depending on, on our emotional moods. But being tired affects how we see color, and age affects how we see color. But my main advice to the people who uh, print their own pictures, and I'll leave you with this before we start the demo, is don't drink and print. <laughs> when you're photographing, take the full shot and then move in and take the closer shot. Try to tell the whole story. I have more examples of this as we move along. I'm just going to breeze through these because I want to get to the, uh, want to get through the demo. Get to the demo. Photograph sequences. This is a, a caterpillar, or actually a butterfly hatching. All ring light shots, but again, we're telling the story as the butterfly comes out and dries its wings. You can order caterpillars, by the way, uh, mail order. And if you do, you'll see some shots. I raised them in my kitchen while I was doing this butterfly book. And it was just amazing to watch these animals hatch. So here's, a, here's a, some more about telling the story. This picture was taken with the 100 millimeter macro lens. This was taken with the 50 millimeter macro lens. And this picture was taken with the 65 millimeter macro lens. And the ring light. I talked about on the ring light that you can control the light, right? In the afternoon, late afternoon and early morning, we have a greater, we have pictures with outdoor pictures with the landscape pictures or cityscape pictures with a greater sense of depth and dimension because we have that side lighting because those shadows add a sense of depth and dimension to the picture. So for this shot, because it's relatively flat, I turned off one of the tubes almost all the way and then most of the light coming from this way so I could see all these different scales here. I should have the straight on shot, but I don't. So this is how close you can get with that 65 millimeter macro. You can see each scale. So here's the question. If there's a butterfly expert in the room, please don't, uh, please don't answer. What color are these butter, what, what color uh, is the, are the wings of this butterfly? Any guesses? White. White? Okay, any other guesses? Well, here, here's the answer to the question. It's a trick question. All butterflies have clear wings. All butterflies have clear wings. It's the scales that add to the color. So if the scales come off, all butterflies do have uh, clear, clear wings. And here's just another example of a creative composition. Don't shoot everything straight on. Here, I just tilted the camera a little using the disequilibrium effect, and I had the wings go from one edge to the other edge and you can see all these scales. You want to shoot. When you're shooting with the ring light, you, there's no need to boost up your ISO. You can shoot at ISO 100, which is another advantage to shooting with the ring light or the twin light or the two flashes like uh, David Brommer was suggesting. If you're doing natural light pictures, close up shutter speed is, you really have to set your shutter speed high because just like with the telephoto lens, camera shake is exaggerated. So think about your shutter speed, very important when you're doing natural light pictures. This is a dead leaf butterfly, a photograph down in uh, Coconut Creek, Florida. Uh, a silk moth, a nice black background. Silk moth, same moth in a slightly different position where we could see the background. It's up to you when you're using a ring light what, what, uh, what you want the background to look like. If you use a slower shutter speed, you'll get more of the natural light. If you use a faster shutter speed and a small aperture, not enough light's going to come in and the background will go black. We'll try doing that when we start our little demo. I mentioned that uh, a wide angle lens before. This was taken with a 16 to 35 millimeter zoom. You know, I like this shot. Nice enough shot, take with the macro lens. Here I place the subject off center. Again, you look at this, looks like eyes, so if a bird's flying around, looks like all these eyes are looking at it. It looks like the animal is actually uh, bigger than it is, 
And you saw that picture, the close-up. Remember I, I showed you the picture of the moth that could detect the mate 600 yards away? Well, this is the uh, same moth there. So here, too, I was trying to uh, tell the story. Okay, so we have beautiful backgrounds here. How many people think they might try macro photography? True macro, okay, so just about everybody. That's cool. Try this, then. <clears throat> the background can make or break the picture. I've said that probably half a dozen times, if not more, by now. Well, the background isn't always great. You saw in my uh, kitchen, I used my black t-shirt. Try this. Go out and photograph a leaf. And using the blur filter in Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, Lightroom, Aperture, or whatever, blur it a little, and then blur it a little more. And make inkjet prints. Then you'll have these backgrounds and put them on a piece of cardboard, you'll have these backgrounds that you can take with you. And this is, this is my uh, kitchen when I was working on the butterfly book. Here you see one of the chrysalises. Here you see um, uh, one of the, uh, the butterflies that had just hatched. This was actually my kitchen. We had all these. <laughs> so my wife was really unhappy. But we had the ca cat caterpillars only eat one type of food. So if you're going to do this seriously, you want to get the right type of uh, food. And, and here's, like, uh, here's like another one. And here's one of the silk butterflies. Before I started this, uh, I, I, got, I spent a lot of time photographing silk butterflies, playing with my lighting. You can get them online. That's where I got the guys that I have up here. Oh, so there you see it up there. And here you see arrows pointing to the different and what, what, uh, caterpillars uh, and chrysalises. What's interesting, my friend from Florida, Alan Chin Lee, the expert, sent me these. He said, whenever he sent it to me, he said, it's going to be 12 days before they come out. It's going to be 16 days before they come out. It's going to be nine days before they come out. He was always right. And it's really fascinating because before they come out, they start to shake. And this is really a game of patience because once they start to shake, you don't know if it's going to be an hour or two or three. So we spent a lot of time just watching. But here I want to get a shot of this butterfly, this little caterpillar. But the background in my kitchen was bad, so I used the, uh, the, the printout where the background was like totally blurred. Same thing here. This caterpillar was eating, taken with a 65 millimeter macro lens, handheld ring light, but I added that nice green background. Same thing here. Here's a nice plain background. You know, if you're, if you're looking to, at Sports Illustrated, some of the football players are photographed with like 600 millimeter lens shot wide open, the background's really blurred. It would look totally out of focus. So I used that third uh, inkjet print th that I showed you. You know, I shot it in focus, blurred it, blurred it, to really draw attention to this, to this subject. So it's a lot of fun to do this. Here, it looks like leaves in the background. Well, here was the shot. This was taken down in Coconut Creek, Florida. Really bad background, but I just held that inkjet print behind it. What you want to look for is shadows. So here's a failure, right? We see the shadows from the ring light, and this background was too plain. The busier the background, like here, the more you can hide, hide, that, uh, hide that effect. Another kitchen shot with the green background. Six, again, 50 millimeter macro lens. A 65 millimeter manual focus lens. So it's really a, a fun, fun project. This is what I was telling you about. You know, if Alan said 12 days, you know, maybe on the t uh, 10th day it looked like this, on the 12th day it would look like this, it would start to shake, and it pops out. Has anyone ever seen this happen? This, it's amazing, right? It pops out so fast, we call this like a little trap door, but then it does hang in there for hours. Uh, drying its wings. So I have the whole uh, sequence there. Just some more close-up shots. And here, uh, what you want to do is, again, you want to watch for those reflections. You want to watch, I had to clone them out there. There are some here. That's one of the disadvantages, maybe the only disadvantage to using a uh, ring light. Beautiful shot, right? Again, taken in my kitchen. Here's the, the behind-the-scenes shot. End result shot looks like it's been taken outside on a beautiful day. We're just going to breeze through these and then get to the uh, demo.
<laughs> so the, the, the question is, uh, did, it, did I have like a million of butterflies flying around my house? No, we have maybe had six, six at a time. We had six at a time, but... Say again? Well, over the, maybe over a day, yeah, we'd have six. So we, we drank a lot of coffee, and it, it took a lot. I mean, we, we couldn't leave. After all this effort, you know, to, to see one of these great creatures hanging, we, we just couldn't miss it. Well, yes. Yes. So how do you not scare them away? Well, one way not to scare them away is to use a long lens like the 100 millimeter lens, but you'll see I have a picture of a humming moth in here where I used the 100 to 400 millimeter lens set at 300. But you know, if you run after them, you're gonna scare them away. The best thing to do is just wait. I have a butterfly bush in my backyard. You just wait and the butterflies come in. Here's another nice shot of an IO moth here. Looks like it's taken on the bark of a tree. Once again, it's just photographed in my uh, kitchen. Another couple of shots showing the uh, uh, emerging, emerging. This is a dagger wing butterfly. Oh, I hate that when that happens. We're almost done, and we're going to get to the live demo before the people have to leave at uh, at one. It's a butterfly bush. <laughs> What's a butterfly bush? It's very cool. Here's a butterfly bush in my backyard. So they come in different colors. Okay, every uh, <coughs> fall or spring you want to cut them because they grow really fast. It's a terrible picture. It's a busy picture. But it shows you what a butterfly, I just took a snapshot of the butterfly bush in my backyard. Uh, Ron, next time, we'll hold the workshop a little earlier in the year. We'll do some uh, close-up photography. But here's a close-up of the flowers, so it attracts beautiful butterflies like this. We have, we have hundreds and hundreds of butterflies a day visiting the uh, butterfly bush. This is the humming moth. Anyone here ever seen a humming moth? The first time, here's a picture of it flying. Taking with the 100 to 400 millimeter lens at 300 millimeters, you asked how not to scare them. Now, it was small in the scene. You use a low ISO, a, a camera with a lot of megapixels, you're going to not get a lot of noise. But the first time I saw a humming moth, which is about this big, I thought it was like a baby hummingbird, right? I mean, it's a, I, man, I can't believe hummingbirds come that small. But a humming moth is a, really an amazing, amazing creature. Here I added some blur, here I added some more blur. Another example of uh, choosing the right uh, shutter speed. And Okay, I'm gonna end, or we're coming near the end. This is one of the most amazing experiences I ever had. Working with these scientists on my app in the butterfly book, we went to Mexico to see the site of the overwintering of the monarchs. All these, there's, there's probably a thousand monarchs you know, just in this little area. All these trees are covered with monarch butterflies. They come from North America they, and get down there. Scientists told you might wonder, how do they get there, right? How do they know how to get there? Well, they only eat milkweed, according to the science. Well, I know they only eat milkweed, but according to the scientists, that this milkweed has this, these tiny little spindles in it. And when the caterpillar ingests this, these spindles stay in their body, and when they form into a butterfly, there are these little like sacs in their wings, and these uh, spindles are magnetic, and it acts like a compass guiding them down to this. Like how amazing, oh, wow. how amazing is nature? So anyway, it's a very busy shot. It does show what it looks like. Here I'm getting closer, trying to tell the whole story. Where well, you have again this tree. We saw we saw like probably 5,000 butterflies take off at one time, land on a branch, and the branch fell off. Because <laughs> there, there were just so many butterflies. Just an incredible, incredible thing. Here, I'm using a wide angle lens, a 16 to 35, to tell the story. Here you can see the, the butterfly's wings uh, flying. Here, depth of field is also very important. You see the trees in the back are lined with butterflies. And I'm moving in with my 50 millimeter macro lens to help tell the story. Uh, I really like this picture. It's taken with this little butterfly over here. You see these little antennas here? Who's my friend here with a little compact camera? What do you have? G9. G9. I was having lunch. We were there only there for a few hours. And I was having lunch. I had my little G10 with me. And I just raised my camera. I took this actually with the G10. So you don't need a $7,000 camera <laughs> to get a shot where you could see the antenna. 
Also, I crop this. Again, just never underestimate. Or as our past president used to say, don't misunderestimate the, the importance of cropping. That joke doesn't go over too good in some of the places that I speak, but it's just a joke. It's just a joke. Go ahead, sir. Do you use the AI servo mode? Do I use the AI servo mode? Okay. The difference, what he's saying is, do I use AI servo on Nikon cameras that's called uh, focus tracking or continuous focus or, or, or whatever, as opposed to one shot? I'm always using for the butterfly pictures one shot, because I'm not photographing a single butterfly. Most of the subjects here are not, are not moving. And here I'm, I'm telling the story. The sad part of this story is there were probably, uh, according to the scientists, when we were there, probably about 3 million dead and dying butterflies on the ground, 40 million butterflies there. Because what's happening is all the people around this mountain, this is on the top of the mountain, are chopping down all the trees for firewood and for their homes. So the butterflies have to go higher and higher and higher. So it's getting colder and colder and colder. When we got there, I had all the wrong clothes. It was snowing when we were at the top of the mountain. And, and there was frost. And that's why you see the butterflies on the ground. Uh, but I'm working with scientists. So we got in there and they hired me to document this. It was a sad thing to see. And someone's going to ask that you have to walk over them. The answer is yes. But I'm working with the scientists to get the shot to draw attention to this because something's got to be done. This isn't a conservation speech. I'm just sharing with you that, you know, something's got to be done because if they keep taking the trees, there's, you know, you're going to have 40 million, you know, butterflies with no place to go. I'm just going to share this with you before we start the demo. This gets a lot of laughs, but a good exposure is like a slice of pizza. So here's my advice. I don't know, Ron, if I shared this over the weekend, but if you're making your prints, and if you drink Coke or coffee, it has caffeine in it. If you drink alcohol, this is going to affect the way you see colors. We also see colors at different times of day, depending on, on our emotional moods. But being tired affects how we see color, and age affects how we see color. But my main advice to the people who uh, print their own pictures, and I'll leave you with this before we start the demo, is don't drink and print. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to shoot? Who wants to shoot? You raise your hand first. I saw it. Okay, the only thing is, the only thing is, you ever hear the expression, you break it, you buy it? <laughs> Tim? Okay, you want to take all those prescription glasses? Oh, no, no, those are good. What? Okay, because your pictures are going to, he has glasses on, his pictures are going to look a little dark. <laughs> okay, so what I want you to do is, so the ring light's on TTL. Okay, there, we're gonna take, get rid of this guy. Okay? Yeah. Where do you get these butterflies? Where, I just got them online, I typed, I forget, there's a place in New Jersey, it was like silk butterflies. Tim's gonna take a shot and then we're gonna evaluate the shot and see if we wanna do something differently. Okay? Good enough. Okay. I okay. saw the crew over there. What? The crew. Oh, that's a, well, it's a fake butterfly. Uh, Pre pretend, it's, uh, pretend it's some sap that dripped from a tree. I have to use, uh, use uh, something to touch up now? No, no, no. Oh, uh, wait. Uh, okay, so this isn't our Tim. I know. I want to make a put. No. What's it setting on that? Pardon? Okay, you'll see. Okay, don't drop that. Okay, so you, you that's a pretty nice shot, okay? It's a little dark. Here's the setting. Right, so we're at an 80, 80th of a second. Here's the beauty of the ring light. It's a little dark. In flash photography, okay, we have it set on zero. The meters measure reflected light. So the bright pink there is fooling the camera's meter into thinking the scene is a little brighter than it is. Uh, so it's darkening the exp Let, Let's try it one stop. Try to take the same shot. Okay? Pardon? I have the flash, flash exposure compensation was set at zero. In other words, it was what the camera thinks. Here, keep holding that, Tim. 
what the camera thinks is right. Okay. But wait, 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 wait. What did I say, Tim, when it comes to composition? No, this feel better. Well, but what did I, what did I say? Oh, no, same shot. Right. This is not the same shot, so our exposure is going to be different. Okay, Tim, we're giving you one more chance before we get the next shooter. Who wants to shoot next? Okay, you raise your hand. Okay, now let's see. We're going to uh, put our, our exposure back at zero, Tim. Same shot. <laughs> it's the first or second? This one. This one. Okay. The, the reason I'm doing this is seriously, it's very easy to change the exposure, right, with this, uh, this type of unit. You could also do it in camera, as those of you who have like a 7D know. Let's see. Okay. It's, it's better, but it's still a little still dark. dark. Let's just try to get the right exposure. Tim, okay. same shot. I'm just going to give it plus a third. <laughs> Okay, the metering style is the question. It's average metering, not spot metering. It's metering the whole scene. Now, Tim. Okay, I think somewhere in between that and this would be okay. Okay? In flash photography. Thank you, Tim. Let's have a big hand for Tim and next shoe to come up. I'm just setting this up for you. Okay. Okay, so you're gonna shoot. And by the way, if you're gonna if you don't anyone here ever use live view on their cameras? Live view is like a great thing for uh for close up photography. Okay, here we go. When you're doing natural light photography <laughs> You're going to have to boost up your ISO, for the, just to make it easy now. With the new cameras, by the way, you get less noise at the high ISOs. You can shoot it on, you're going to shoot at ISO 640 here. I'm going to put it on uh, aperture priority. Okay, you're going to take the shot. <laughs> Be careful. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, and the other thing you want to do is because you want to avoid a camera shake, very important. You want to use either. Uh, a cable release or the self timer, which is what you're going to use. Okay. What? Brings up a good point. Uh, we should change the white balance. The white balance here was set to, well, we have automatic white balance, which you shouldn't really be shooting on. You should set it on flash if you're using this. Here, we have a combination of uh, tungsten. I think, are these tungsten lights? Well, I know these are fluorescents, but I don't know what the, what? They're daylight. So we have a mix of daylight and tungsten. Our best bet in the mixed situations would be to use daylight, uh, automatic. But whoever asked about the white balance, who you asked about the white balance, you should, you should really never shoot, unless there's a mixed light source, never shoot on, uh, on automatic. Sure, you could fix it in, in, in the dark room, but you're better off. So let's see what happens here. Well, you can, you can use mirror lockup. George Lept, you know him? If he were here, he would say you have to use mirror lockup. So where's the um, self-timer? Right. So, well, it's set on self-timer. Oh. So all you have to do is take the shot, press the shutter release button, and let's see what happens. Okay. Yep. So look at this. This is, the flash does something else. The flash gives you, no. The flash gives you, it adds contrast to the scene. It adds sharpness to the scene, and it adds color. It brings out the true color to the scene. Okay, so this is a lot softer than the other shot, right? It looks pretty nice, but I don't like the background there. So let's move. If anyone has any suggestions as to the picture, you know, we're all yeah, friends. Take your shirt off, <laughs> and I'll hold it up for you. Okay. Let's try. Sorry. Let's try this. Come and shoot. You had your chance at fame. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to shoot here. What what I'm not liking is the uh, background there. See at the top there, and there there it looks like a little better. But look at the depth of field. Here we're shooting at f4, right? Let's bring this down to 
F14 and see what happens. We're going to have a lot more depth of field. Right? So it has a lot more depth of field. Again, if you want more depth of field, that's, that's, that's really not so bad. Well, I might crop that a little bit. Um, but you, sure. Yeah, yeah, well, we're, we're not using a flash here. This is all natural light. Right. So we, we had a longer shutter speed. Our shutter speed here was a, a fourth of a second. Okay. Uh, if we wanted to use our, let's just throw the ring light on here so we could see exactly the How difference. Are you change the white balance? Okay. Pardon? Not in this situation because we have daylight lights and we have fluorescent lights. So that, if you look at the green of this butterfly, that's not that and the, and the color of the flowers. It's not, it's not drastically off. Okay? In mixed lighting sources, I would definitely, sh like if you're in your kitchen where you have daylight coming in and fluorescent lights, I would shoot, I would shoot on... Uh, With with uh, with with less depth of field, you know what? Here I don't know how to get back to the uh, previous one, but it had a lot less depth. We'll take. We'll, let's take a shot. Let's take a shot at the uh, at the widest setting on this lens, two eight. Maybe the whole butterfly won't even be in focus. Automatic. Because if we set it for fluorescence, the daylight might affect it and make it look weird. If we set it for daylight, which these lights are daylight, that might make it look weird. So here you see, to answer your question, here you see the, um, the shallow depth of field. Okay, who said the custom white balance? You want to shoot? <laughs> yeah. She said, do I recommend the custom white balance? If you have time to do it, yes, do the custom white balance. What I use, and this is important, uh, if you're really serious about color, like if I'm working with a scientist or whatever, I use a device called the Color Checker Passport. They sell it here for 99 bucks. It has like a gray, gray tag Macbeth color checker on it, a little color pattern. You shoot it here, and then what you do is comes with a CD, you put it on your computer, and uh, you calibrate your camera to the computer. Do I ever use an Expo disc? I have used the Expo disc. The color checker is more uh, more advanced. So I see we're losing some people. We're near 130. I think I uh, hope you had a lot of fun. If you have any questions, I'll be here. And uh, again, sorry we got started a little bit late.